I'm aware that this uh, two and a half hours that we have together comes at the end of a work week, perhaps for you. It certainly comes in the middle of the ongoing insanity that we call politics and climate change and the more personal turmoil of having a body, um, having to deal with money, having to deal with other people. <laughs> so uh, in light of this, uh, what can we really do together? Because at the end of the two and a half hours, you'll still have to deal with other people. You'll still have a body. It's still gonna give you trouble. You still have to cope with money. So, I mean, what can we do that actually, you know, is more than let's say two and a half hours of being slightly more pleasant or something like that. That's, you know, that's, I take that as my assignment. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I feel some clarity about that. So rather than have it be uh, underneath, I'd rather just bring it right to the front and tell you what I'm hoping, <laughs> wishing for you with, you know, with goodwill. If at the end of our time together, you have some sense of possibility that there's a path that you are yourself uh, empowered to um, take up and you have some sense of a first step, even one step, and that you feel a motivation about that, if for no other reason than because you recognize, as we'll talk about it, the intoxication of the life that we usually live, right? But perhaps a slightly more encouraging or positive way of looking at it is that we could have so much um, more happiness and peace. We can be so much uh, kinder and more skillful in our lives. And wow, wouldn't that be great? So the sense that of human possibility and some specific mm, feeling really, not just your thoughts, but a feeling of being called in that direction and some thinking mind knowing, hmm, this is a good place to look. This is a good way to approach it. So if we can get that much in our two and a half hours together, good for us, you know? Um, so I invite us to start by looking at the mind as it is right now. So as you're hearing me, we're entering into a relationship that's gathered out of kind of out of nothing, right? There was an announcement. You saw the announcement. You showed up on the interwebs here now. And now there's this, and at the same time that we have this fabricated social situation with postage stamps on a computer monitor, your mind is functioning, perceiving this, and it feels like this. You have a certain feeling in the body right now. What is that? What are the mind states like right now? Is the mind agitated or is it calm? Does the mind feel spacious or somehow narrow, contracted, or maybe focused down, don't know? How's the... Uh, Comfort level, first the body comfort, like 
being in your chair. Some of you might be on a cushion. And how's the comfort level in the mind? Like as you're listening to me, your social conditioning, not just from your family and your friends in this life, but your genetics, the social structure of your brain and your hormone systems is operating right now so that you're assessing me and maybe you feel comfortable or maybe you feel like, hmm, this guy's a little bit weird. This is not the way a Dhamma talk should go. You know what I mean? Maybe it's like, danger, danger. I don't know. What's it like? Or maybe it's nice that I'm being honest about it, you know? I don't know. So how does the body-mind feel in this relationship? That's what I'm saying. We can know these things any moment that we bring mindfulness forward and say, what is the nature of experience now? That's one of our remarkable capacities. But we often get so caught up in the pushing forward of the mind. It's like a imperative. There seems to be no choice. It's like, oh, I can't get off this train. We don't even think about it. You're sitting on the train. You're going to wherever it's going. That's it. But there is this choice to be awake. And when we're awake, especially if we understand maybe something about what brings suffering and what brings happiness, what brings peace, then we can make those choices. And if we're not awake, if we're not aware, then it's just cause and effect without any volition. Boom, Zzz, and off it goes moment by moment right now that's our situation that's what life is each moment choice aliveness or intoxication just being intoxicated and flooded by our own blindness and pushed forward by the body's hungers, the mind's hungers, pushing us forward and we don't even know it. That's the pressure we feel of life. That's the pressure. That's where it comes from. The Buddha called the tanha, thirst. Just the mind, the body always wanting something more. And then he used those same, that same teaching um, wanting to exist and to be seen, wanting sensual pleasures and to avoid pain the kama tanha and the bhava tanha and the vibhava tanha, the escape from, oh my God, this is way too much. Get me out of here. Fear of life, fear of other people, wishing for invisibility, wishing to die, moving into what? How do we do that? Addictions, distractions. Wow, right? The Buddha <laughs> kind of named that stuff didn't need the internet to show us how obvious it is. But that's where the pressure comes from. And he used that same, those same constructs to talk about intoxication, a mind being intoxicated and blind to being trapped. It's sort of like uh, each of us is intoxicated with our wanting to be seen a certain way and exist and to have food for the senses that we appreciate and want and all that and going for it and this blindness flooded by it. And we don't know it. So it's like we're drunk and we think, oh, I can drive just fine, no problem. But 
we don't know that we can't, right? And so we go bumping into other people and oh, eventually the big crashes, the big, the big problems happen out of that, out of our ignorance. And this is, this is the kind of the life where we say, can we do better than that? It's got to be, we got to be able to do better than that. And that's where something, if, if we're lucky enough, that's where something like uh, wisdom teachings come in, like the Dhamma. That's what that is. It's like, a, it's another way to see this human situation. And here we are, you and I saying, do we have another way to see it? And that's what we're here for today. Practical, it's about the path, you know I mean? We're actually gonna get practical. So let's look at practically what's happening right now. So there's a community that's gathered, temporary, that's fine, but there's still, look at this, there's a, you know all these people, there's a certain amount of attentional energy, and there's also the specific spiritual friendship of mutual support where I'm speaking as a spiritual friend, sharing Dhamma and the words touch your ears, right? But the way that happens is it has to start. Like it comes from this mind, the Gregory experience into language that the mind forms, concepts, notions, feelings, gets words wrapped around them. My muscles move, my diaphragm pushes air out. It moves to microphones, gets digitized, goes across the internet, hits your having tuned into this particular little tiny nexus on the internet. And those digits come into through your system and the audio channel gets A to D, D to A. I'm the A to D. On your end is the D to A, digital to analog conversion. So those digits move a speaker, which is physical, real world, directly analogous to my throat, to my vocal cords. And that pushes air somewhere out of your headphones or out of your speaker in your monitor, and the air touches your ears. And the words are deciphered by your mind. So what started in my mind ends up in your mind. Every time I say that, I'm amazed. <laughs> I, yes, I'm the one that said it, but I'm still amazed by it. This is mind to mind and it's Dhamma. But let's finish that thought. Spiritual friendship, the, the, the Buddha speaks of spiritual friendship being the whole of the holy life. Well, this is it. And we're practicing the Noble Eightfold Path right now. And let's look at the path factor of right view. The voice of another, right now it's me, wise attention so not only does the sound touch your ears but you're paying attention to it or at least i hope so some of you probably are maybe all of you the voice of another and wise attention psh, psh, that's the connection are the conditions for the arising of right view samaditi the important part here is not just this connection and that this ha is happening. It's that we are already right now cultivating right view. Therefore, the Noble Eightfold Path is active right now. It's already happening. You're already on the path. You see what I'm saying? I need to see some physical response because you can't talk to me. Okay, I see a couple of people got it anyway. That's good. So this is 
this is path path work here. This is the Noble Eightfold Path unfolding. And all I'm doing is naming it. It was already here, right? That's what we're doing today. Seeing how we can find it already active and by beginning to understand the path and the power of spiritual friendship on the path, that that makes it so much easier and more delightful and more possible and more effective. More effective. Effective in freeing us from intoxication. See, we have to know why we're doing it. Otherwise, you know, kind of we get lost. Don't have any way of saying, is this working or not? But if you see that you're more intoxicated, it's not working. If you see you're a little less intoxicated, it's working a little bit. I mean, that's important because we all, I, I don't think you would be here if you hadn't already had some exposure to Dhamma, to meditation. And now we're saying, ah, let's take another step. So there you go. So what's the direction of that step? Where are we going? We just said, away from intoxication, towards detox. And certain things that we uh, can cultivate through formal practice, and through good living. And so let's not look away from the part of it that is just already functioning in your good life. Let me just see, maybe by a show of hands, how many of you value honesty and consider yourself to be a pretty honest person? Okay. Marvelous. Isn't that wonderful? I'll raise my hand too. So already, every time you're speaking honestly, you're practicing right speech. See what I'm saying? Very simple. We, I'm saying these things as obvious as they are. I hope you'll bear with me, maybe even forgive me, because we can easily get this sense that the path is distant that it's too difficult, that it's alien, that it's old fashioned, that it's restricting, or I mean, you know, there's all these things that we can think about, but actually it's very natural, very accessible, and already in many dimensions operating beautifully. I mean, honesty, wow. The things the Buddha said about honesty, if you happen to respect his teachings, a person who would tell a lie, there is no evil that he or she might not do. So it's like foundational. And here you already manifest it. And when you speak the truth in a way that is timely, kind, perhaps, and that has benefit, that's right speech. So it's already operating in your life. Think about your profession when you speak truly in your work. Wow, I mean, if you're doing that, let's just say eight hours a day, that's fantastic. And if we have a profession that compels us to tell untruth and to mislead, that's pretty powerful too, you know? So we can see that when we talk about right livelihood, the really big stuff that came first, you know, 
wrong livelihood is, you know, a livelihood involving killing, stealing weapons, slaves or marketing in living beings. Uh, hopefully you're not involved in those things because boy, do they, you know, rot the mind. Think about it, eight, 10 hours a day of being involved in making weapons or poisons like, you know, tobacco and so on. Wow. On the other hand, think about the good in whatever your profession might be. And if you're retired or, you know, not employed or something, think about the other good things you do to contribute to your community. It doesn't have to be a paid job, but think about all that time aimed towards the good. What's the good in what you do? Very powerful. So right livelihood could very, that aspect of it could very well be active and healthy already in your life. And I'm just inviting you to look at it. There's a lot of, uh, value that's been placed in the last, say, 10, 15 years on mindfulness. And mindfulness is a powerful thing. And right mindfulness, wow, it's even more powerful because that power of being awake is going towards ethics, compassion and a clear understanding of the human condition, a root understanding of ignorance and its cessation, right mindfulness. So when I pause now and you know your own mind and you're aware of our relational experience now and you feel it's being aimed towards wisdom, towards freedom. This is the practice of right mindfulness. Have a look, I'll pause. You can have a look. The capacity to know experience without being fused with what the mind fabricates. And underneath that quality of sati, of mindfulness, and therefore infusing it, woven into it, infused into it, is this sense of direction towards both the waking up, towards human care, towards a recognition of, uh, you know, well, different aspects of Dhamma at different times will come forward to you like the pain of grasping or or the, you know, the impermanence of your own experience and everything around you. Because sort of how does wisdom infuse your mindful life? Right view and right mindfulness coming together. It's not distant. It's not distant, it's available to you. And, you know, we're in the process now of unfolding exactly how, and we're in relationship to do that. That's how it's happening right now. This is it. So, 
So the sense of pausing is central to insight dialogue. Some of you may have practiced it or heard about it. But it's a practice of insight meditation that unfolds, that does not exclude speech, listening, being in relationship, and still developing sati and samadhi, mindfulness, stillness. So we're going to explore that practice, not just for its own sake, but specifically because it uh, is very um, effective. You know, this is for a lot of people at coming to understand in an embodied way, this sense of a whole life path. So there's a purpose here. So um, I'd like to offer you a uh, reflection and then we'll have a few minutes of silence all together. And then I'll remind us of the reflection. I'll remind us of this insight dialogue guideline pause, and then we'll go into groups of three, at which time you will have uh, four minutes. You're gonna take, insight dialogue just happens fluidly, not taking turns, but it's good in the learning process and as one form of practice to also take turns. So each of your members, your partners, will have four minutes to speak and the other two will be listening. And then you'll all be together for seven minutes without the form of taking turns. And uh, so the, when you first get together into your breakout room, decide who's going to go first and second and so on. So you'll get an extra minute or so to just do that, to settle together. And then the first person will start speaking and so on. You'll get prompts from the uh, you know, broadcast, little prompts on the screen, when to change partners and reminding you of what we're doing. So I'm going to invite a reflection now on where you see the path alive and awake and dynamic in your life, even if you haven't framed it in that language. That's a very important addition. Even if you haven't been thinking about it in terms of specific Buddhist path factors, I'm gonna name some qualities and some path factors and you see where they are in your life, just like we've been doing so far. So, for example, in right view, it includes study and discussion that is aiming towards wise understanding. Think about Dhamma as a exemplar of that quality of understanding that's liberating. Where do you practice right view already in your life? What conversations? what friendships, what meditation practices, what reading, what books, what podcasts. Okay, where's right view already being practiced in your life? By the way, I thank you for shaking your heads when you hear me, that's really helpful, actually. I get, you, I get that you get it, so we're, you know. Um, and uh, so another practice, right intention. Now, let, let me tell you some surprising ways that intention is cultivated. Do you have any, uh, uh, let's say, Buddha images or other images around the house or around your work or even in your, on your jewelry or something that reminds you of what is deeply good 
that remind you of compassion or that remind you of wakefulness or that remind you of peace. Photographs around the house. Artworks, music that you subject yourself to that inclines the mind towards compassion, towards wise understanding, towards kindness. What vows or commitments have you taken towards appropriateness? Like if any of you have been married, it's a vow of sexual appropriateness and fealty. It doesn't look like a noble eightfold path in a normal, you know, in, in like some Bible thumping kind of way, but it's life, isn't it? Where in your life are you already cultivating right speech? true and useful, spoken at the right time. Think about it. Don't take it for granted. Don't take the little stuff for granted. Where in your mind, in your life, are you already practicing right action? Starting with the precepts, where are you already abstaining from killing and harming beings? Where are you already abstaining from stealing? Very easy to take that for granted. You go into a store and you think, you don't even think I'm not going to steal. <laughs> you just don't, or at least I don't. I suspect most of you don't. See that and see, oh, wow, right action. It's built in to my, you know, through my cultural upbringing. Don't think about where you blow it, right? That's not the time for this. Right now, it's where you are practicing right action. Abstaining from intoxicants that make you crazy. Where are you already acting in sexually kind, appropriate, careful and safe ways. Again, don't take for granted anything. Just like look at what's really there. And where do you feel those circles of care extend to meet this call from the Buddha? As he said, it's wonderful to care for yourself. It's wonderful and good to care for others, but the one who cares for oneself and others is the highest and the best. Where are you already doing that? In political, social, climate action, with your children, your parents, your good friends? Where do you, where do you work on behalf of others as well? And don't just fixate on that. Also look at the other aspects of right action. And right livelihood we just talked about, but also how we use resources. Where do you already use your resources with care, spend your money with care, consume things with care, energy, clothing, the requisites of the monks and the nuns that works for us too. Clothing, shelter, food, medicine. Where is it already appropriate in your life? You care about it, you watch it, you're not wasteful. Right livelihood. Where in your life are you already practicing right effort? Where do you bring energy, like right now, to listening to what I'm saying? Where do you bring energy to, let's say, go meditate somewhere, go on a retreat, because that's the easy stuff to see. You can like, like, oh yeah, I put effort into that. But also remembering that right effort is the cultivating of the wholesome and the, the preventing or the diminishing, the abandoning, the unwholesome. So right effort is the psychological out with the bad, in with the good. So if you've been engaged in psychotherapy, if it has any wisdom component at all, you can frame it in terms of right effort. 
but any of the abandon, you know, the effort to develop a, well, the precepts, but also uh, a mind that's uh, awake, the right effort to cultivate sati. Anytime you practice metta, compassion is right effort. Because right effort runs through all the other path factors, just like right mindfulness and right view. So just look for where you bring the energy towards the good and diminishing the unwholesome anywhere. Where do you already practice samasati, right mindfulness? And finally, where do you already practice sama samadhi, right stillness, right calm, concentration, right tranquility, both the explicit samadhi of meditation and deeper samadhi, but also those aspects of calming and tranquilizing the body-mind in a way that conditions you towards the wholesome. Where do you give attention to relaxing, to calming? Where do you focus the mind in a way that is balanced and kind? But, you know, still enough to stay where it goes, right? Where do you already do that? Like experiences of flow in any field are in that direction. Okay, so obviously with only four minutes and the whole of your life being infused with prolific goodness, you won't be able to say everything. Much more powerful to pause, really see what's true, take your time, literally pause, even pause while you're speaking to make sure it's still true. You know, stay with it, stay with the sati as you speak. And as you listen, what you're receiving from the other in this framework, in this wisdom framework, it's always like, wow, teaching me, you know, guiding me, telling me how you do it. How great is that? Pause. So start with just a moment all together. Then I'll just give you a quick reminder and you'll, go, you'll be brought right into your rooms, okay? So just have a moment together just to just sort of prepare the body mind. Where's the path alive in your life already? Okay, so soon you'll be brought into your rooms now. And again, just to remind you the contemplation, where are these path factors already operating, already alive in your life and guiding your actual practice of speaking and listening and being with others is the guideline. Pause, quite intentional to bring the mindfulness into and something true might be spoken and heard. Pause.
Now is a good time to turn towards jumping the gap from the ending of our time together in an hour into the moving stream of your life and specifically life as path, yeah? I think it would be good to get as um, specific as you feel called to be. And in order to do that, it can be very helpful to have the actual guidance, the Buddha's guidance on the, the path. So here's the thing. How can all of life, everything you do, internet, brush your teeth, money, work, sex, family, clothing, cars, on and on, right? Everything. How can all of that fit within eight path factors? Oh my. Well, there's some easy answers to that. And then there's some more nuanced learning that we can do about what's possible about to understand the path factors and how they actually apply. And I'll hit some of those easy points because um, they really, they really work. They're really important. So one of them is, uh, you probably know the uh, little quote, um, you know, all actions come from the mind. The mind precedes all actions, you know, that kind of thing. So once again, as we sit here now, we take a pause and just look at your own mind for a minute. Just check out your mind states, your mood, whether it's clear or cloudy, any sense of maybe motivation towards what's good or maybe noticing any feeling of a distraction or agitation that might be present as well, anything. Just noticing the mind as it is. So, is there any moment of your life where this, these mental body processes are not operating? It's an absurd question, right? Of course. Always. Therefore, the path factors associated with cultivating the mind and it's operating in a wholesome way or not are always operating and available for either formal practice or just setting up the conditions and letting the conditions carry you, because that also works. For example, is there any moment when you could not practice right mindfulness if you wanted to, or if you remembered? I would suggest not. <laughs> it could happen any time. There are times when it's really difficult, right? like when you're doing intellectual work, for example, or of course, when you're carried away by emotions or by high pressure circumstances that overwhelm you, obviously that's tough. But mindfulness at any time is possible. From birth, we don't have the training yet, but all the way to death, from now till you die, including the moment of death, it's available to you.
Do you believe that? I do, and I've been close to death. So, I'm convinced. Okay, one down, seven to go. That's always available. So how about right intention? Now, right intention flows naturally out of right view. In other words, how you see the world aims the mind, aims the heart. If you believe, for example, that constantly accumulating, um, you know, uh, experiences and uh, pleasant things and objects and money and power is going to make you happy, of course you're going to try and get those things, right? So that's how right view is connected with right intention. If you believe that giving and generosity really are important and, 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 and de-center the self and bring uh, a lightness and a happiness and a harmony around you, then naturally you're going to want to give more because you'll feel the goodness of it. You'll know, wow, this is great stuff. If you believe that giving just, you know, um, pulls away your little piece of a limited pie, then maybe you won't give so much. So how you see the world, i.e. view, perspective, is going to condition how you aim the mind. But you can intentionally aim the mind in all kinds of ways. I'll tell you one of the most powerful, your friendships, who you spend time with. <laughs> it's an absolutely brutal discourse that the, that the Buddha gave where uh, he's basically saying for most of the sutta, if you can't find someone good to be with on the path, don't be with anyone. <laughs> and he's absolutely uncompromising about it. It's most wonderful. You know, not wishy-washy, not new age, not nothing. And if you do find such a friend, go for it. How great. So the recognition of the power of good friendship because it inclines the mind towards the good. That's the right intention, sama sankapa. The aiming of the mind, because other people who are well aimed aim us, they incline us, you know? So all of the path factors. The Buddha said, the spiritual friendship, good friendship, is like the dawn to the sun of the Noble Eightfold Path. One who has good friends can be expected to cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. Wow, that was easy. I thought this was going to be hard. <laughs> but, you know, here on this screen, you have a bunch of potential spiritual friends because they're hearing the same talk and if I'm even a little bit convincing, what is convinced within their mind meets what's convinced within your mind. And, a, you know, the little spark of the fire is kept alive. Very easy to get overwhelmed by the cultural flood of greed, hatred, and delusion. Spiritual friends are precious. Now, I wish I could just say, you know, take those names and email them, but it doesn't work that way technologically. Um, and I don't want to impose anything on anyone. I'm very careful about that. On the other hand, if you have any way of taking advantage of this circumstance or perhaps getting my book and just getting with a friend and going through it with a friend, not just alone. This is a powerful way to, you know, uh, bring spark to the kindling.
aiming the mind. It aims the mind. And also remember what I said earlier about Buddha images and photographs of people that inspire you and statues and even, even natural beauty and the way it reminds you of the mystery of that. Surround yourself with that. Those are practices of right intention. And they're always available. Let's say you have a job that's kind of like demanding and you have to do a lot of thinking and mindfulness isn't so easy. Stick a reminder on your desk of sati, of samadhi, of peacefulness. Perhaps stick a reminder on your desk of compassion and change it often enough that it doesn't become you know, factored into the background. And that is a practice of right intention. Do you see why? You see how it aims the mind, inclines the mind? Intention is the unspoken heart place that says, this is where, my, this is where I'm in, this is where I feel called. Now we can feel called to cruelty and hatred. We can feel called to self-obsessive sensuality. And we can feel called to compassion and to simplicity and peace. So check that out, right? Anytime. Another fairly easy win for the Noble Eightfold Path in this very life. Every time you read, as I said earlier, hear a podcast, have a conversation. Your perspective on life is prepared to be touched and to, it's the malleability of the mind, the plasticity of the brain can be at work to shift how you see things. So right view is always possible. The practice of right view, the development of wise understanding but you need to feed that. I'm being very directive. I hope you can bear with me. It's another old white guy telling you what to do. I deeply apologize, but I hope it's worth it because it's not my stuff. It's like ancient wisdom that I'm trying to share with you. So when you do read the discourses or you read what's been well digested and well considered of the discourses rooted in some wisdom tradition that really has some substance, then when you're out and about, that's available to you, even though it's, you know, conceptual, intellectual, it becomes, it makes that jump from knowledge to wisdom by way of experience. You put it to work. So when you do things like, whether it's read my book, study the suttas, go to some good Dhamma talks and stuff comes into you, then those aspects of right view become available while you're out taking a walk, while you're having a, you know, a family dinner. So, you know, load up the, you know, those, you know what a pellet stove is? It feeds little bits of compressed wood into like a, it's sort of like a wood stove with an automatic feed, but it's pellets and it has these turning auger like bits that bring the pellets into the stove or it works that way with coal too, but that has such a bad vibe to it. So that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're filling the pipeline with wise understandings, with knowledge, even if it's conceptual, but it becomes the fuel for experience. So you have some friends you can have those conversations with, and that's friendship, not just in service of right intention, but friendship in service of right view, study in service of right view, and we can do it, right? How strong is our commitment to wholesome behavior? It's going to vary 
Let's not be idealistic. Sometimes, you know, we feel cold to an intoxicant or to stretching the truth on our tax returns. I mean, that's just life. And let's not pretend that those things aren't also within us and around us. At the same time, how could you possibly cultivate the sila, the morality, right speech, right action, right livelihood, without the mindfulness and the understanding that it takes to do that? Like, what is wholesome? What is harmful? What is harm? So you have to look at your implicit bias, for example. You have to look at where you're blind. That's not easy. As a white patriarch, I can tell you, you know, if you don't look, you don't see it. But that's true for all of us. The privilege of living in the West and so on also. And the incredible power and potential harm every time we touch money we enter the international system of inequity. But how can we do that wisely and awake? How can we be part of the going towards the good rather than the harm? These are decisions we can make. Some of the, some of the Noble Eightfold Path is going to be natural, like I'm saying. I'm pointing to those pieces of the path that also say, okay, let's dig in. Let's make a difference here. Let's do this. Let's live differently. And the rewards are like right there instantly. It's not like, you know, if we don't do this, we're bad people and that that's, the, you know, there's rewards. Peace, the absence, as was said earlier, of hiri and otapa, of conscience and concern. There's a lightness. The Buddha speaks often of how the meditating mind settles in the absence of remorse. Wow. That's very beautiful. That's very beautiful. Absence of remorse. Loving those around us. If you have an animal that is a companion of yours in the house, like a dog or a cat, Look at the love that you're giving to them, the generosity that you share with them, and feel joy in that as well. Your kindness that is already existent towards your parents or your children, your close friends, your generosity to your meditation teachers, these are already in your heart. And when we're called to like really, you know, really strengthen our path, wow. So this is now your contemplation. I'd like to give you um, not taking turns. Okay, got that? What that means is that the quality of your practice together will be mutually dependent upon pausing. Some who are inclined and very skillful at speaking may have the habit of speaking a lot, and it might be very beautiful what they say. But is there the space for the all? So I'm going to share just the beginnings of, and I'm not going to go into the details of this very subtle practice, in inside dialogue of pause, relax, open. But I'm going to invite you to notice, like even as we're talking now, that you can sense into the shared space that we have, visually perhaps, but also the shared, you might say, psychic or mental space that we're in together as we explore the path. And that I could, if I, you know, we each have now many people on our screen perhaps, but if you're just with a couple of people, which you will be in just a moment, pause, settle down, intentionally relax, and open 
And now, this is where you listen. And this is where you speak. It's a very subtle practice when we work on it intentionally and develop it to a high degree in meditation. This is just a beginning to support us in this investigation of the path. Pause, relax, open, open. Sense of mindfulness established internally, externally, and both internally and externally, okay? And your contemplation now is how you feel called and where you will actually enact now, reinvigorate your living of the Noble Eightfold Path. And authenticity is good. Like if you don't feel inspired, it's okay to speak that. If you do feel inspired, it's okay to feel childlike joy. It's just no judgment. We're all in the human experience together. So let's take uh, uh, 16 minutes all together. No need to take turns, but let yourself be supported by pause, intentionally pausing while you speak, while you listen. Just let the body mind settle, relax, and let that, just let the spaciousness of open be available to you. And let the mindfulness of the other be very crisp sometimes and very soft as well. It can change. Pause, relax, open how you will enact the path, where you feel called, where you feel inspired, any specifics, you get a little gold star for each specific. And uh, may you all be happy and free. I'll see you in 16 minutes. Well, friends, it's been two hours and 11 minutes. There's 19 minutes left. And uh, so has this been worthwhile? You don't have to answer that. Um, I think that maybe we'll know as you, you know, go from here and uh, live the path. I'd like to close by offering you a few uh, kind of possibly helpful handles, and then we'll make some space just to talk about things generally. The first you've already been doing, it's what I call a path scan. So you can move through all of the path factors and just say what's active now. And if you want to take a subset of uh, path factors or even just one, you can just scan that factor, different features of right view, different features of right mindfulness, and so on. But to scan the whole path anytime at all, and just say, how's it going? And allow yourself to be surprised that it might actually be going pretty well, <laughs> you know, because the path is, there's wholesome qualities that are in each of us and that we're all living, perhaps unaware of the wholesome conditioning that's already operating for us. We see the unwholesome, a lot of it, pretty well. And self-criticism, of course, is a, a, many of us have it as a favorite hobby. But um, yeah, so the path scan can really be a helpful thing. Another is what I call a path factor inventory. 
And this takes some knowledge, meaning like what are the, uh, not just nuances, but what's sort of the main content of each path factor and see how that's um, uh, existent, operating uh, in your life. Um, and sort of use it as an occasional assessment, a path factor inventory. Also, something I didn't mention, um, and I'll just touch on briefly now, and if you feel called to um, uh, get my book, uh, this is provided there and some unpacking of it. Um, there are what I call six tenets or six fundamental operating principles of a whole life path. And I'll just name them briefly in case there's some extra inspiration that comes to you. And then if you're interested, we can talk about it or we can let it go. The first is to ground in the Dhamma. Very simple. The point being that if you have a wisdom system that operates outside the the constrictions and preconceptions of our, your culture and your and your upbringing, then this uh, can be a very powerful way of coming out of uh, sort of a random good luck kind of path. And you have uh, some, you know, you have a real reference point in the um, in the teachings of the Buddha. And when you do engage those teachings. The next tenet is to engage the teachings as practices, all of them. The Buddha never wanted to just teach philosophy. So if you're reading something like about the aggregates or dependent origination or impermanent suffering and non-self and all these things that seem like they're talking about what's the nature of life in some abstract way, take the next step practice those things, which is to say, reflect, look for those things operating in your life. And then from there, they come into your heart. From there, they become um, guides like impermanence. Just, it's not just sort of knowing things are impermanent. Actually observe, observe your own mind, observe the world around you. And that then that practice is obviously a practice of right view. It's got right effort in it. It takes mindfulness to do. So the, the path is functioning that way. But also you know that all of those teachings are practices. And the third tenet is to exclude no moment, no experience, and no teaching. So that means not cherry picking the Dhamma, like just mindfulness or just Samadhi or something like that. Uh, so, in, you know, let the whole thing in, but also there's no moment left out. So you have a sense like, I keep referring to us, you and I right now, this is path. It's like that. It's like every moment there it's, and it, it's a great, it's a wonderfully freeing notion to know that the path is always here. You could think of it as being, uh-oh, <laughs> I better not do stupid stuff, you know? But it's much more along the lines of, well, if it's always path, there's always possibility. There's always a possible next movement towards peace, towards kindness. There's always this possible next movement towards seeing things clearly and being free from the, you know, the harangue of our conditioned lives. And the fourth one is to find each teaching in the here and now, which is to say, to really uh, uh, look for it in your life as it's actually there. Don't assume that these teachings are too obscure, too difficult, beyond you in some way. That's just not true. There are some teachings that are extraordinarily subtle, like the further reaches of samadhi, for example, or the subtle aspects of dependent origination. 
yes. But even those, you can catch some of the fragrance. Even those, you can say, what can I understand and feel of this teaching? And the majority of the teachings, you can actually really uh, understand probably in, a, in, in quite a direct way in your lives. So that's the working assumption, finding it in the here and now. Then the fifth one is to let all the teachings in fully, which is to say, subject yourself even to the ones that are difficult, like say rebirth, or, you know, maybe the uh, more demanding aspects of morality, uh, or even, even those teachings that are just like, just too far out to get, like superpowers and stuff like that, and just don't reject it. Let it in and see what it does, see what happens with that. What is it? What can it say to you? What might be there that elucidates your very life? And the ones that you do understand, let them all the way into your heart. Like, like really let them challenge you and, and open you. Loving kindness for all beings, like extending the mind to all quarters of the universe. And like, wow, wait a minute. <laughs> really? Yes, really. That kind of attitude, you see what I'm saying? And then finally, engage the teachings individually, in relationship, and socially. This is something that becomes, in, you know, really accessible for people when they practice insight dialogue. But even if you don't practice insight dialogue, start seeing how practices like right view and right mindfulness can unfold with other people and how, as you practice all the path factors, it extends to all those around you and, and your participation in a wholesome and just society, that it's not separate, that it's all there all the time. So I'll stop there and um, maybe say a couple of practical things because otherwise I might forget. Uh, uh, first, um, follow on practice from this is you, obviously I've been suggesting that from our very first moments together. Um, you're fortunate if you're in London, this is presented by London Insight, that there's an Insight Dialogue group in London. I don't know if they'll be joining the general effort towards the whole life path offerings that are going to be coordinated for next fall, but if they do, then you'll have access to that. Another thing is um, whether it's with the help of London Insight or the Insight Dialogue community, but at least through your own efforts and insightdialogue.org, you can get access to the whole life path teachings and find a friend and do it. Again, as I said, I don't know how you could take advantage of knowing these people here have all been, you know, like at least um, introduced to these teachings, but it doesn't, you know, it can happen any number of ways. Um, and just so you know, when I'm, it seems like I'm hawking my book, I don't, earn any money from it. All the money that comes in, I donate to the Insight Dialogue community. So this is genuinely an altruistic effort. And so I can say with confidence and a clear heart um, that, uh, you know, that this book can be useful and you know that it's not for my personal financial gain. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then you'll find more teachings on the whole life path uh, and, of course, Insight Dialogue at insightdialogue.org and gregorycramer.org. I think that's enough of that kind of thing. So, um, first I'll thank, before we close, uh, 
London Insight and Karen, thank you for supporting us today. And Nancy, always wonderful. And Liz, thank you for being here. So um, I do hope sincerely that there's something that comes on onward, you know, for you from this. Um, and uh, it's good to take a moment as we close to remember uh, the privilege that we have that makes this possible, this being together, uh, both the very fact of our uh, physical safety that makes it possible to do this is not universal and to remember that. And uh, the, the, the great good fortune of having spiritual friends, having a teacher, having a community, even a temporary community, and then London Insight as a community, the good fortune of that. And to reflect on beings who are suffering and to let them into our hearts that they might benefit from this even though they're not here through our future actions, but also in ways that we don't know allowing the sense of possibility of whatever is good flowing through us and being amplified in the world. So much suffering. There is so much suffering in the world. So may this be a benefit to all beings, seen and unseen, the born and the yet to be born, far and near. May all beings with that exception benefit from our practice together. And may there be peace. May there be peace. May there be peace. Thank you, friends.